Welcome to this year's edition of the Hamia Festival. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you for joining us today for a discussion on the decolonization of mental health. My name is Sarah Gatoni, and I will be facilitating a conversation with Gart Stevens and a panel with um, a curated list of artists and scholars. The theme this year is social justice and mental health. Under this theme, we're exploring the decolonization of medicine and public systems as a critical element of ensuring social justice in mental health systems. Almost 70 years ago, Franz Fanon started discussing the many post-colonial concerns associated with race and cultural identity. Known as a key thinker on decolonization, Franz Fanon shed a light on the pathological attachments of subjection created by the colonial environment. Despite the many years separating Franz Fanon's first observations on the pathologies of the colonial environment to today, the need to decolonize remains relevant in the post-colonial era. Sectors of the society, such as education, transport systems, um, the functionalities of the modern economy at large, as well as health systems, are still affected by the legacies of colonialism. We will begin this conversation with Professor Gart Stevens and proceed with a, with a panel discussion. Uh, professor Gart Stevens is a professor and clinical psychologist at the University of Wits in South Africa. His research interests include foci on race, racism, and related social asymmetries. He is also interested in knowledge production, critical psychology, ideology, power and discourse, violence and its prevention, historical collective trauma and memory, applied psychoanalytic theorizing of contemporary social issues, as well as masculinity, gender, and violence. He's published widely in these areas, both nationally and internationally. Uh, welcome to the festival, Professor Stevens. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hi there, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Uh, so, Professor Stevens, today we hope to engage you on, as mentioned, the topics of decolonization and mental health, specifically why thinkers like Franz Fanon, who uh, are known for linking colonization with mental health, how they remain relevant today. And so uh, I'll begin with um, asking you to give a quick introduction of yourself and your work. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, uh, well, firstly, thank you to the festival organizers and to the University of Global Health Equity for the invitation to be here. I really, really appreciate the, uh, the, the possibility to be in conversation with all of you. Uh, and thank you also for the introduction around Fanon's work, uh, because of course, Fanon is one of the key uh, decolonial thinkers that we continue to turn to and that we continue to resurrect and recover his work. Uh, he was deeply influenced by people like uh, Amy Césaire, Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, he was influenced by the work of Marxism and the work of uh, Negritude. And of course, he was also uh, very critical of uh, psychoanalytic work like Freud and Octave Manoni and so on. He was prolific in his, in his short lifetime, uh, but really focusing on the kinds of questions that you've already illuminated by. And that is work on language, on culture, on alienation, on bodies, on symptoms uh, in the body, uh, on the colonization of the mind and institutionalized care for those uh, in mental health institutions, and really bringing Fanon to some critical, critical insights about uh, the nature of mental health and its relationship to society. And, and in fact, the relationship between mental health and violence and colonization. So, you know, my work has really been interested uh, in, in both race and violence. Uh, coming from the, uh, the background of South Africa, those have been two really important dimensions that have shaped South African society and are in essence also legacies of colonialism and coloniality that continue to find their resonances in South African society today. Uh, thank you, Professor Stevens, for that introduction. Uh, you mentioned that we keep resurrecting uh, thinkers like Franz Fanon. And so my first question to you would be, 
Many people might understand colonization as something that happened a long time ago. In what ways, in your observation, are the legacies of colonialism present in our understanding and treatment of mental health? Thanks. Um, so, so, I mean, I think it's a, it's a fascinating question, partly because, you know, when we think about decolonization uh, today, we certainly connect this to what is commonly referred to as the decolonial turn. And people think about this as Caribbean writers and Latin American writers really uh, starting to talk about decoloniality uh, as, a, as a body of knowledge in the 2000s, in the early 2000s. But of course, we know that there's been a much larger lineage of uh, decolonial thinkers that go back uh, very deep into the 20th century, the early 1900s, the mid 1900s. We had people like Lumumba, uh, Amilcar Cabral, Nkrumah, Biko, Fanon, all talking about decoloniality at that time. And I suppose for, for me, the, the issue of decoloniality is really about trying to understand and be attentive to the ongoing legacies, the ongoing effects and consequences and resonances of decolonial or of coloniality uh, in, in our contemporary lives. Because of course, coloniality continues to have resonances in contemporary life, uh, particularly in countries, of course, that, that consider themselves to be post-colonial. Now, the three dimensions, I suppose, that, that come to mind immediately are, are ways of thinking about decolonizing knowledge, uh, decolonizing power, and then decolonizing the very way that we are, that we are being in the world, our subjecthood in some ways. And so when I think about uh, knowledge and the decolonization of knowledge that's already been alluded to, of course, most of us are trained in a canon that is m m predominantly Western and Northern in orientation. And if we think about this, our understandings of mental illness come almost uh, directly from Western and Northern canons. And there's very little about the way that we conceive of and understand and apprehend mental illness from, uh, from local context in which we are embedded. The second is, is really the, the decolonization of power. And I think you've alluded to this already when you've spoken about ongoing relationships of hierarchy, ongoing relations, strategic relations of power. And of course, Kanon was very, very good at, at highlighting that ongoing relations of power had all kinds of nefarious effects on social inequality and social inequality itself is a deep driver of mental illness. And so there is a need for us to tackle and be attentive to not only knowledge, but systems of power that continue to, uh, to entrench modes of social inequality. Of course, the last is really the, 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 um, the decolonization of being, or, or in stated differently, the decolonization of the mind. Because of course, the very way in which we are constituted as human beings, as subjects, is often an, an artifact of a particular kind of understanding of what it means to be a subject or a human being that of course is almost always implicitly and sometimes explicitly uh, appropriated from the global north in some ways. And again, I think that what we are talking about here when we're talking about a decolonization of being is really ensuring that we are not alienated from ourselves as individuals, we are not alienated from each other as collectives, and we are certainly not uh, alienated from history, from memory and from culture. Uh, thank you, Professor Stevens. Um, so you mentioned culture, and as early as the 1960s, Fanon offered an understanding of mental illness as being influenced by society as well as culture. Today, psychosocial factors are recognized as determinants of health. In your line of work, have you observed trends towards recognizing um, or intervening with uh, intervening on the societal factors affecting individual mental health? So um, again, I mean, I think that that's uh, important to to recognize here is that that of course there is a recognition of the way that social factors impact on on health and mental health. There's been a great deal of work, uh, certainly since the 1800s and the early 1900s, and then uh, much more sharply in focus in the mid 1900s on social epidemiology, for example. And social epidemiology uh, really looks at patterns of illness and health or ill health that cuts across society's demographics differently depending on your levels of advantage or disadvantage. The important thing is, is, is whether we can use social epidemiology today to act to reduce social disparities in health. Um, so for example, we know that people of color and certainly poorer black uh, people across the world have higher rates of diabetes. And the question is, is, is why this is the case. So you may very well say that actually poor black uh, people across the world tend to eat 
less nutritionally valued uh, foodstuffs. But the question is whether we can act to intervene on that social uh, epidemiological information to actually reduce disparities, for example, related to poverty. Um, and, and for me, that there is still some disjuncture between much of the work that we do there uh, and, and the actual actions that we are engaged in on the ground. COVID-19 has been a, very, a great example. Uh, it, it's very clear that poor black um, people of color across the world have been disproportionately affected by this. There are higher rates of uh, morbidity, there are higher rates of mortality, there are higher rates of anxiety and depression associated with this. And that disproportionality, of course, needs to be acted on. The question is whether we can think beyond the individual internalist notions of intervention to be thinking much more carefully about things like social grants. Can we be thinking about guaranteed employment in this moment? Is there a different way of thinking about social distancing and non-pharmacological interventions that really take into account local context? Beyond that, I have to say that uh, much of the work that we've always conceived of is either being done through a, a kind of mental health paradigm or a health paradigm that is very much premised on a patient practitioner relationship. It's very seldom that we think about this as much broader scale community interventions. How do we scale these up to larger communities, to societies at large? How do we think about those interventions that don't require language uh, in a one-to-one -one therapeutic environment? How do we think about arts-based interventions that are, for example, much more visceral in their orientation and don't require language in the same way as a kind of core foundational element of intervening. And so I think that there's much work that has been done on trying to map the relationship between mental illness and social factors, but I, I'm not convinced that we've gone far enough on that. And it seems to me that one of the things for health practitioners and mental health practitioners is to think beyond the kind of traditional therapeutics into much more ad advocacy uh, type work and activist work in communities to reduce uh, disparities associated with coloniality. Thank you for that answer, Professor Stevens. And speaking of language, um, we understand that one of the legacies of, of colonialism is the adoption of new languages and the alienation of um, colonized people from their native languages. Fanon recognized language as an important aspect of culture and identity. Um, it is vital to how individuals participate in society. You mentioned health practitioners. It's vital to how people access care, how they understand and explain their health. In what ways do you think language facilitates or hinders our interactions with mental health systems? Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so. so you know, I think many of us who work in uh, the context of the humanities, the social sciences, uh, the arts today uh, would, would probably be supportive of the idea of multilingualism or translanguaging. Uh, and that uh, one, one really thinks about language as being a crucial cultural resource for most people. And I want to just highlight two, two elements uh, of, of language and its relationship to mental health in particular. The first is that I think language is critical to mental health, partly because language structures our experiences of the world. Um, for those of you who've done any work in linguistics or discourse analysis and so on, you'll know that language is the, is the, the mechanism through which we make sense and we convey that sense and understanding to the world uh, when, when we are articulating an experience of the world. In, in other words, language is not only crucial to apprehending and understanding and conveying experience, but because experience is so central to constituting who we are, language is critical to structuring ourselves. It is critical to structuring the subject, him or herself. And so uh, when one then thinks about the, the centrality of language in dealing with, the me with mental health, language itself is implicated in whether it is that we have access to um, to, to knowing ourselves uh, sufficiently or conveying ourselves sufficiently to others uh, or not, in, in other words. And so language is a central feature of the constitution of the self. Without language, it is deeply difficult, in fact, to, 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 to be constituted as a subject in totality. Now, I say this partly because uh, when we are forced to rely on different languages, when we're forced to, to adopt and appropriate different languages that are not our mother tongues, our home languages, we force ourselves to convey an experience that is only partial. 
we can only ever then convey an experience that is partial. Um, most of us will know that where we have a, a mother tongue, and in fact, where we try to code switch into another language, that in fact, it's very difficult to sometimes articulate things in a different language. There's not always the tools and the resources to be able to convey what it is that we really are trying to convey. And so we can never really convey a full uh, appreciation of ourselves to others, and others are unlikely to fully understand us. Now, this becomes critical in the, in the context of trying to assist people with mental illness, uh, because of course you need to be able to have a common platform in which, uh, through which to understand. The second point I wanted to make about language here is, is really about uh, people who find themselves in the healthcare professions today. And there's a critical issue around health communications research, of course, and we know that increasingly health communications research shows us that, uh, that conversing in mother tongue, for example, is critical to not only understanding the nature of the illness that is being uh, under scrutiny, uh, that is being attended to in some ways, but is also critical to health outcomes. If people cannot understand each other and they cannot understand what it is that, uh, that, that is at the foundational basis of an illness, a mental illness in this instance, it becomes extremely difficult to manage. And health communication research will tell us as well that language is critical in these spaces. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that answer, Professor Stevens. And now, um, going back to Fanon, who was a known critic of colonial psychiatry, uh, Fanon wrote about the pathological pathologization of people living under colonialism. The theory, for instance, that um, I quote, the Algerian was born a criminal, was taught at universities for more than 20 years, and as a researcher on the topics of racism and knowledge production, in what ways have institutions of knowledge production moved towards inclusivity um, and what remains to be done? Thanks. I mean, again, I think it's a great question in the, in the context of the world that we find ourselves in today. And I say that partly because, of course, race seems to be, race racialization and racism seems to be on the resurgence in the world today. Um, I say it's on the resurgence in the world today because you see this in the likes of Jay Bolsonaro, you see it in the likes of Donald Trump, you see it in the likes of Marine Le Pen, Siet Boulders, uh, really re-evoking ideas of uh, anti-immigrants, uh, xenophobia, uh, white supremacy, race, etc. And, and so I, I, I think this is a moment for us to be really, really mindful of what Fanon was saying about racialization and its relationship to mental health. That race in some ways and racialization, racism, is at the core of mental health challenges for many, many uh, across the world today. Um, so, so when you ask a question about inclusion and uh, inclusivity, I think that there are many moves afoot to be more inclusive, but I think that we live in perilous times. I think that we live in perilous times around the rise of neoconservatism, around the rise of new forms of racism that I, I think will, will be fundamentally related to further forms of alienation and mental health. I, I, I want to give you an example or two, you know, and this comes from people in the world of mental health. Uh, Marian Herstein wrote a book called The Bell Curve. Uh, in the early, uh, probably about 20 years ago. And it was really about race and intelligence all over again. They were really making the argument that actually people of color were 10 to 15 points lower on any IQ scale. And they did this under the guise of science. Bruce Gilley, in a, a couple of years ago as an anthropologist, wrote a, wrote a paper called The Case for Colonialism, where he really argued that colonization was good. Uh, those of you who know anything about mental health and psychology will know these two names, Jordan Peterson and Steven Pinker, who've both written increasingly on the relationship between intelligence and race, and have argued that somehow race and intelligence are connected again. Now, I, I raise this because what we're starting to see is the, um, the deeply, deeply unwelcome return of race science in our midst. And I think this is a moment to be deeply concerned about the kind of rise of ethnicism, identity politics, and race science. And many institutions are challenging this, but I think that we need to be much more careful about this uh, if we are to be more inclusive and to be mindful of Anon's injunctions about the relationship between race and mental illness. 
Thank you, Professor Stevens. As we wind down, I will ask you to please summarize um, in the context of mental health, you've spoken about language and race and violence and how these affect mental health systems. So if you could please summarize why do you think uh, France Fanon is still relevant in 2020? So I'm, I'm, my sense is that, that Fanon's not going to be uh, relevant today only. I think he's probably going to be relevant for many, many decades to come. Uh, and and I'll, I'll just highlight four quick points about this. I think that what Fanon did was he was uh, brilliant in identifying the, the nature and the effects of coloniality and colonial violence and its relationship to mental health. It was one of the, uh, the earliest uh, uh, kind of expositions on how it is that social factors and social systems can be critical in incubating mental illness uh, in populations. So this is something really important today still. The second is that uh, I think that the social dimensions of illness that he highlighted included things like exploitation, oppression, inequality, uh, gender disparities, poverty, class, and so on. And I think again, a, a world that is becoming increasingly uneven, uh, this is critical to understanding mental health. Of course, it should not be, uh, you know, a surprise to us that Fanon wrote carefully on the on the question of race, uh, identity politics, ethnicities, etc. And again, I think this is something to be uh, to be taken seriously in a world in which one sees the resurgence of uh, right wing neoconservatism and racism all over again. And then, lastly, I think uh, what, what Fanon really encourages us to do is to rethink the nature of knowledge uh, and understanding of mental illness completely. I think he's asking us to turn it on its head in some ways. He's asking for us to think about um, what it is that we can do from the positions that we are located in. How can we generate new knowledges from the, the locales that we find ourselves in, the communities and the societies that we find ourselves in. And that really mental health is deeply rooted in social context and that we have to expand the canon and the archive of knowledge to really understand and appreciate mental illness today. Thank you so much, Professor Stevens. That's all the time we have for this conversation today. Thank you for sharing your insights on the legacy and work of uh, Franz Fanon and the links between uh, decolonization and present colonialism with uh, mental health. And now uh, for the next part of our conversation, we'll be moving to a panel discussion with various artists and scholars. And I will begin by introducing uh, Dr. Errol Francis. Um, Dr. Errol Francis is a photographer, artistic director, and a curator of heritage projects based in London. He has a background in activism and is a fine arts practitioner with over 20 years of experience managing projects. His work has been supported by Arts Council England and various private foundations. He's currently artistic director and CEO of Culture End, as well as the director of the New Museum School, um, a program providing education and training for diverse young Londoners. He works across various art forms and has collaborated with many artists as well as curators. Welcome to the call, Dr. Errol. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. And our second speaker today uh, is Dr. David Fakunle. Dr. Fakunle is a self-described mercenary for change, willing to employ any talent and occupy any space to elevate anyone who feels divested from their truest self, particularly people of color. David earned a PhD from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, his research interests include stresses within the built environment, manifestations of racism in society, and uh, how arts and culture can be used to strengthen health equity and liberation. As an artist, David has utilized storytelling, drumming, theater, and performance. Uh, he is also co-founder and CEO of Discover Me, Recover Me, an organization that empowers narrative for personal and organizational growth through African oral tradition. Uh, hello, Dr. Fakunle, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you. And last but not least, our third panelist is Mr. Christian Yampeta, who lives and works in London. He's currently a candidate at the Visual Cultures Department at Goldsmith, University of London. Yampeta's ongoing exhibition activities in art, design, and theory include the convening of a roaming program of exhibitions. His previous exhibitions include Ecole d'Histoire um, and many others. Mr. Nyampeta also runs Radius, an online radio station, and was awarded the Art Prize Future of Europe in 2019. Hello, Mr. Nyampeta, thank you for joining us. Hello. And so to begin this conversation in keeping with the theme today of decolonization um, and mental health and how the arts can be a bridge between the two, um, I'll ask for a quick introduction to your works um, in this area. And I'll be starting with uh, Dr. Francis. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I mean, yeah, my work in this uh, area has crossed over a number of different um, periods um, in terms of also institutions. I've worked in the health service and in fact I worked in a, I set up a, um, a, a project that was called the France Fanon Centre and the reason for that was to confront the ongoing problem of um, uh, oppression of uh, black people um, by means of the psychiatric system and trying to actually confront a number of themes which um, we, you have been talking about in the previous discussion around diagnosis and how um, the uh, construction of the colonial subject as other actually is reflected in clinical practice and in institutional power and in terms of um, the use of force in um, uh, com compelling people to uh, receive treatment in this psychiatric system. Um, but also in my artistic practice, I have um, been looking at this um, and uh, engaging with this theme in terms of otherness and how the constructions that we see in, for example, Frantz Fanon's work are reflected in cultural politics. And so my work in museums and the way that decolonization as a kind of strategic or political practice extends from institutions like the psychiatric system into museums. And that was really apparent this year with the Black Lives Matter campaign, because what happened in America to George Floyd um, is also something that happens in psychiatric services. So. The, exactly the same thing that um, happened to George Floyd, um, being suffocated and violently restrained by law enforcement officers happened in the psychiatric system. But what was interesting about this summer was the way that the critique of this kind of um, uh, uh, oppression by means of the criminal justice system then also led into the critique of museums. And so we had the tearing down of the statues and the struggle over colonialism and imperialism as reflected in museums. So it really reflects the way that the themes that Frantz Fanon um, um, talked about extend through various institutions, not only in the colonial um, uh, terrains themselves, but in the metropolitan centers in, and, and it's an ongoing um, crisis. So yeah, in my practice, I, I work with this in terms of being an artist, but also um, as an activist and working with community groups and um, practitioners um, to, to actually um, uh, address contemporary concerns. Uh, thank you, Dr. Francis. We're glad to have you. And now I'll extend the same question to Dr. Fakunle. It was such a pleasure learning about Frantz Fanon. I did not know the man uh, before a couple days ago, but there's so much of what he wrote and talked about in his short life that certainly makes sense now. The work that I do in public health really is about decolonization 
And it's not just specific to people of the African diaspora, uh, of which I am one, but a realization of how much a story has been imprinted on all of us, particularly within public health. So what I do, I am a storyteller. Uh, the storytelling is primary. The public health research is secondary because what I realize is that what my field needs more than anything else is to be empowered to tell their story. So the work that I'm doing currently is to show the utility of storytelling within the public health context is not just about how we can use it as a research modality where it does have a lot of value, but how we can use it as a healing practice. So much of the ideas that that France Fanon was talking about, these dual roles, code switching is what we call it, uh, certainly here in the U.S. and I'm sure abroad, it's called code switching. There's who we are when we're amongst ourselves and then there's who we are in public, uh, in the white space. And we struggle, people of color, people of the African diaspora struggle with that uh, juxtaposition all the time. And certainly what contributes to our mental health and it being deteriorated and the trauma that we deal with is just that. Who are we? Who are we? Because depending on the space that we occupy, it varies. That can mess with you. And that certainly contributes to the mental health outcomes that we see. What I have experienced as a storyteller, as a black man in the United States, is that so much of the liberation and the freedom that we want can start simply by telling our story. If we look at the history of art and culture anywhere in the world, we know that anytime there has been a oppressive system, what's one of the first things they go after? The art. So now in my capacity as a storyteller and as a public health professional, I'm empowering people to fight back against whatever system they're in with their stories. And so far, it's made a big difference. And trust me, I'm as surprised as anybody else as to how people have really latched on to it. But it all makes sense. That's the one thing that is unique to every individual is the story that they can tell about their lives. And I'm trying to do my best as a researcher to capture what that means, what that process is like, what the outcomes can be. But one thing I can say, it makes you feel better. And I, part of what I want to do is to say sometimes it can just be that simple. Telling your story makes you feel better. And that in itself is liberating. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fakunle. We're glad to have you. And finally, to Mr. Nyampeta, I would like to ask you to introduce your work um, in the context of decolonization and mental health. Um, yes, thank you so much for having me. Uh, indeed, my name is Christian, Christian Nyampeta. I work as a visual artist, um, and I'm actually now speaking from New York where I live, and um, I'm very glad uh, for the biography you read, and I'm happy to say that there are some updates to it, but I will I'll talk about it um, uh, as we go. And um, so I describe myself as someone who organizes uh, programs um, that um, have to do with a um, um, an attempt to work out a number of uh, pedagogical experiments that include um, 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 inquiries in, um, in, in, in the uses of space, times, and relations uh, that can be between individuals or institutions and also realities that tend to uh, sit on opposite as, uh, sides of the spectrum and um, that manifests in the form of uh, films, exhibitions, publications sometimes, writing, um, and also all kinds of um, uh, setups that are not always so easy to describe. So um, in the context of um, this, um, yeah, this festival and in particular this panel, um, I was very glad to receive the invitation. And of course, I was also uh, worried about what I could say about um, these themes. 
uh, because I'm not trained within um, the realms of um, uh, psych uh, psychology or psych psychiatric studies or the histories thereof. Um, then I resolved to accept the invitation in part because um, perhaps one thing I could contribute uh, besides affirming the uh, what has been said also by Lisa and Dejuru about the uh, the reality of um, uh, mental health as mostly situated within the patient as opposed to uh, as part of the uh, society widely um, that I, 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 I affirm and I'm very glad for that particular formulation and uh, but the other thing that one perhaps could add is that from my like guideline of the artistic I would um, I tend to say that somehow the uh, the formulation of mental health seems actually odd in how um, it's uh, accepted as just a thing we say and you know uh, understand as a as a, a valid um, articulation of what we want to say with it uh, because when you really think about it mental mental you know exists in the realm of logic reason um, um, rationality, all these categories that tend to produce what uh, is often described as the book, as in, um, you know, a kind of linear um, genealogies of how to think, how to be, that have been passed on since, um, I don't know, um, millennia, and especially in, during the last maybe 300 years of um, uh, humanities. Whereas health, um, to me, uh, seems to evoke uh, body, emotions, feelings, and other aspects that um, are uh, often, in fact, um, relegated to the realm of the feminine, and often also, therefore, uh, the the wild, the savage, the uncivilized, and so on. Uh, which is why, in in part, the, um, the which is maybe partially what explains the um uh the um i guess the 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 malaise and the difficulties around speaking about mental health and accepting it as part of the uh functioning of a um of a human being and therefore of the society widely and their communities so um i guess in my work um, and in, in my interest in general, I have this, um, um, in, I'm driven by an impulse to uh, work out how to limit those separations between what could have been described as a realm that belongs to rationality and another realm that might belong to feelings. And um, I guess the way that happens would start if I was to perform that role now, would of course be to slow down a little bit and trying to work out what we also mean by decolonial, uh, which is a term I tend to use as little as possible, uh, partially because I feel that it is self-evident that what one is engaged in now um, should be in a function of what a set of practices that could be described as decolonial. But also, um, I feel that it's a term that tends to uh, mean so much and also therefore so little in particular contexts. Uh, so I feel that um, I guess in my in my work in general, I tend to pay a bit more um, attention to not accepting the terms as they come, um, and that might that might also find expression in different um, um, in different material arrangements within the space or otherwise. And as I'm speaking now, I just remember that once I made an exhibition that I think it had a work within called The Orphans of Fanon. And it has to do with, um, I guess, thinking about what would have happened if the likes, so not only Fanon, but if the likes of Fanon were alive today. Um, not to say that Fanon is not alive, because I think he's alive in our minds and in our actions and other ways that we interact but um, that there is a particular orphanage that comes with the passing of these figures and how to think of that uh, condition. Um, 
as a, um, uh, as a material basis for uh, cultural practice. Um, anyway, that's a long-winded introduction to myself and my work, and I hope some kind of conversation emerges. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you, David and Errol. Thank you all for providing um, an introduction to your work and linking it to decolonization. And now I will ask you to please um, elaborate further in your different practices as artists. How do you link your work, the topic of decolonization and mental health specifically? And I will start with uh, Christian. Um, yeah, um, so as an artist, meaning someone who works with, um, let's say material cultures, uh, especially material cultures in my case, I, um, I am always torn between being diligent, meaning being professional, following the rules and being on time, uh, delivering the requests and so on. And another, another part of me wants to linger in my own mind, in my own, um, you know, um, spiritual constructs in order to, as best as possible, materialize those external requests. So in other words, the interior dimensions of my own um, uh, practices uh, are not always in agreement with the exter external demands. And I'm not talking about you know, um, uh, financial and so on, but simply in terms of how to sim how to materialize uh, exhibitions and so on, and um, and so I've tried to I've started to pay a bit more attention to those uh, tensions, and um, and to accommodate the desires that uh, emerge, and uh, one of those desires is to simplify the um, the activities and the approaches. So an example would be, um, as this moment, of course, it's in the grip of a global pandemic, we all find ourselves having to resort to online gatherings and meetings, which is fantastic because it gives us a wealth of libraries, um, meetings like now, where each one of us is in different um, geographic location and somehow we're able to commune and to spend time and to think together in a way that would be much harder to do if we were to come to Kigali, all of us, to attend the festival. So that's really good. But I also feel that from how I think and work, these uh, possibilities come with uh, new, uh, new tensions that I would describe in the column, I would put them in the column of uh, potentially um, needing, needing to be, um, decolonized and um so an example would be how um this globality this 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 mode of appearing everywhere at the same time uh, puts pressure on how to essentially how to function so um in other words we 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 we, we i'm having to present bearing in mind that someone um, like as though I have an audience of 10,000 people, but actually I don't think I have a 10,000 people audience, but it's the idea that somehow what I'm saying will enter the public realm on such a grand scale, whereas in reality it could be maybe that 200 people are watching now. Um, and I think that it's producing a kind of uh, acceleration that is worth thinking through, uh, whether that's the exact um, activities that we want to engage in. Um, and of course, this is not particular to this event. I'm speaking about the many uh, Zoom activities that I've uh, participated in uh, willingly and with pleasure, but also feeling uh, a certain kind of uh, 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 unknowingness that I'm entering into. So um, yeah, um, I guess my work then in terms of the, the mental tension that that produces is a certain kind of potential schizophrenia, whereas, whereby constantly I'm wondering if I'm not late, if I'm not, um, like, whether I can actually materialize what I promised to do. And um, I'm trying to work out how best to, um, yeah, take the time to, um, to act and to uh, produce meaningfully, even if that might mean less. 
And um, so it sounds like it's, um, yeah, I would like to just simply uh, put that into like interior slash internal uh, dimension of working today out there, um, um, maybe as a, as a starting point. And the other things relate to what I just mentioned earlier as I was introducing myself. So thinking about the mental and what that means in terms of uh, um, the, I guess, historical genealogies, uh, how knowledge is produced, and how the um, mental seems to be only an internal activity that has to function at all costs for anything else to appear, uh, which means it has to um, operate within the realm of language, as uh, Gareth uh, Stevens was uh, saying. Um, and then indeed also finding, other, finding out other ways that um, yeah, such, such health might, might exist and so if I would just to conclude, um, localize the thought a bit more, um, I'm realizing that I'm, my Kinyarwanda is not so good. I mean, it is, it is good, it's operative, but um, partially because, so in a way I would slightly um, introduce another complication. Um, and this will be a question for Gar Gar Garth Stevens as well, um, is that um, in that unknowing, so in that lessening of my knowledge of Kinyarwanda, actually something else happens whereby each time I hear a term, I um, analyze it. As in, I, I, it becomes a whole uh, quasi-philosophical activity whereby uh, for now uh, it's leading me to say that um, the term for health, I think in Kikinia Rwanda it will be Uguzima. It will be interesting to hear other uh, notions of health or mental health altogether to actually pluralize what that could be in terms of cultural practice. Um, so Ubuzima, I think um, most terms that are Ubu, so Ubuntu and so on, um, are uh, substances as in, um, so things that one share. So it's always bigger than a person, always um, uh, relational. So Ubuzima as a health, it's of course something that relates to my own body, but it can't be enough just to be my own. So in other words, it's something that necessarily I would have to extend to my neighbor or whoever else. So I think that's maybe how I would like to think um, um, health in relation to the arts in my own particular um, set of practices. Thank you, Christian, for your insights on how art can play a role in um, sparking the conversation about decolonization and mental health. And now to David, um, your art form is primarily storytelling. What are some of the legacies of colonialism you've encountered in as a public health practitioner or um, observed in society? And how do you address them with storytelling? Well, the, the short answer is that everything is through a white lens in public health, everything. So the way that we analyze, conceptualize, theorize, hypothesize, and discuss health is through a white lens. And specifically, it's through the lens of older white men. So what we're starting to experience and it's been it's been culminating for a while but 2020 has really been a year of revelation in a number of in a number of fronts and public health is no different we're now dealing with a, a reckoning with how public health has been structured how public health has been taught so the pedagogy the epistemology of public health is being openly questioned. So these would be the conversations that professors and researchers may have, you know, around some drinks, you know, at dinner, something like that. But now these are the discussions that we're having in panels and conferences. That's different because it's, it's almost, it's almost like uh, I, I use the analogy of, you know, you are raised by your parents, you know, for, for the first many years of your life. And when you become an adult, you can kind of look back and say, ah, I, didn't, I didn't like that. I didn't like the way that my mother taught me that. I didn't like the way that my father taught me that. And there can be a little bit of a struggle with that because 
it's your parents. Uh, you love them, you respect them, but you can question them at the same time. I think that's what a lot of people in public health are dealing with is they love public health. They appreciate it, they're, they're grateful to it, but they need to question it and question it from a, an objective sense. And it's interesting that questioning it from an objective sense is bringing forth a realization of how the subjective has been missing in public health for so long. So the colonization of public health has done just that. It has removed the context of the personal experience and the cultural experience from the field. So if we look at something as nebulous as mental health, it seems very intuitive to have the personal context because that person is the one dealing with the challenges within mental health. So who better to explain it than them? Who better than to provide the circumstances that are affecting their mental health but that person? But we typically don't ask that person those type of questions, certainly not in a way that gets to the heart of the matter, if that makes sense. What I've seen with storytelling has been a craving for that experience. So whether it's been people in recovery from uh, substance abuse, you know, over in West Baltimore, which is where I started, my mother and I would discover me, recover me, whether it's been professors. So we're talking about the best of the best at, at, at Johns Hopkins, best public health school in the world, bar none. Professors and researchers who have been craving the opportunity to tell their story. And many of them are white. So this idea of decolonization does not have to be looked at solely through a racial lens. The idea of, of colonization, period, uh, oppression, someone impeding on your space. That doesn't have to be based on race. That doesn't have to be based on culture. That doesn't have to be based on anything, on anything, any one particular sociodemographic. Just the idea of someone impeding on your space and planting their flag there and saying, this is mine. That's colonization. And we are seeing that everywhere. So this year in particular has encouraged and empowered people to harness the power of their personal experience. And in most cases, the best way that a person can convey that to someone else is by what? Telling their story. So I've been very fortunate this year to have a lot of opportunities like this. And this one is very special as someone of the African diaspora. My father immigrated to the U.S. from Nigeria. Uh, I've been to Nigeria three times. The last time being, oh, God, 23 years ago. So I am long overdue uh, to come back to the continent. But the idea of truly being ourselves as best we can, knowing that the circumstances of our existence are forever intertwined by things like colonization, um, oppression, racism, sexism, whatever the case may be, is a struggle that we'll have to deal with for the rest of our lives. Because in a way, we will never see who we truly were meant to be because of all of those things. So it's about who can we be despite those things. And much of that process is what a lot of us are dealing with right now. And art is, to me, the universal language. We talk about language a lot. Dr. Fanon uh, talked about language. Art is universal in, in the way that it's able to convey messages of humanity to anyone around the world. Whether it's visual, whether it's performance, whether it's music, we understand that language. So to me, art is the critical element that is missing from public health that can tie in the personal context, the cultural context, the experiential context that is necessary to truly understand what health means to people and how we can be helpful in improving it. Those ideas of what health is varies by context. Well, how else do we get to that context if we don't listen to people's stories, if we don't give them the space to tell their story. And that may take work because they're so used to other people telling their story for them. We see this in the U.S. a lot with black people. A lot of black people are, are not used to telling their own story because society has told the story for them over and over and over again. So it's been like a, a muscle that hasn't been exercised. Well, now we're getting to the place where we need to exercise that muscle because if we don't, it will be atrophied beyond repair. 
So that's, I think, the, the purpose that I serve is to help people exercise the muscle of their narrative and their stories and to strengthen not just the telling itself, but to really tap into all the lessons that just our personal stories have to offer. Yes, we learn a lot from our family, our friends, our colleagues, uh, our contemporaries, but we can learn a lot from ourselves too. And, and being able to say that and, and manifest that is truly liberating. That's decolonization. And it, it can, it must happen at a micro level, no doubt. And that's the epidemiologist in me talking, but as a human being, it can also start with us. And that makes a huge difference too. Thank you so much, uh, David, for that answer. And now finally moving to Dr. Francis. In your introduction, you mentioned uh, the conversation uh, of decolonization happening in public spaces, happening in public spaces, in museums. And it seems that that debate is sometimes centered around within acad academic circles. How do we make this conversation specific to mental health systems and to the public? Um, the conversation about decolonization. I mean, it's, I, I agree with, the, you know, um, David and Christian, you know, the, um, there are problems about the use of this term currently, which I think is undergoing a kind of revisionism. And I think that um, David's um, definition just now about uh, co colonization is somebody planting a flag and saying, this is yours, this is theirs, is helpful because it reminds me of, uh, you know, we've been talking about Frantz Fanon, that Frantz Fanon also gives us a definition about this, which is primarily talking about territory and power as being the fundamental nature of um, uh, colonialism. Of course, he was in that struggle, both as a as a psychiatrist, but also as an activist with the Algerian struggle. So what we get is that decolonization is something that takes place in different terrains. And these could be geographical, but they could also could be at the level of discourse and quite, you know, and, and or concepts like the psyche, um, 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 the unconscious, and and so on. So decolonization then is taking back control over these terrains. And it is um, something which um, Fanon talks about as having been almost inevitably violent in some way, either actually or metaphorically, because it's a, it's a confrontation um, opposing forces and um, you know, whether we're talking about, um, I mean, um, uh, diagnostic systems, or um, in my case, in my present practice, being involved in museums, one can see actually a continuity between, for example, um, concepts of civilization as applied in, you know, heritage and um, humanities or museology, and the sort of things that Fanon talks about in the construction of the other, this uncivilized other, the dehumanized other, the, um, the other who is all body and no mind, and the consequences of these ideas in um, the practice of health. Um, I, I mentioned um, Black Lives Matter, and I, I really want to stress that because that was such an extraordinary um, event that happened this year and really shows us how if we're talking about decolonization as you know as i've said it, it is a confrontation and it is multi-institutional and it's going to involve um human rights and um, um uh, questions of power um so it, it it's a complicated thing and also, I think that the, the um, if you like, the, geograph the geography of it being something which, um, in a way, when, when, we, when Fanon was writing or when the great colonial struggles, you know, the first half of the 20th century were happening, these were happening in the colonial territories themselves. What I think, especially with the rise of the new right and the ongoing effects of 
racial oppression, this struggle now taking place in the United States, in Europe, you know, in these metropolitan centers, I think it gives a different complexity to what we might mean by de decolonization. Um, because um, we, are in, we are in the space of the, if you like, the colonial master. Um, the museum, you know, like for example, museums or um, psychiatric hospitals in the UK, we, we are in a, um, um, an, if you like, an imperial power structure. So how do you decolonize that when it, um, it's as it were, the space doesn't physically belong to you, what, but um, we are here in, you know, in, you know, I, I'm part of a, um, a group of people that is referred to as a minority, you know, as a, within the population. So the practice of decolonization or the meaning of it or the strategizing of it is somewhat different. So, in, I mean, in my work in museums, decolonization takes the form of things like equal representation of um, the, the um, black and um, minority people in the museum workforce itself. It's going to involve things like um, restitution of objects stolen by um, uh, colonial powers during the imperial period, you know, things like this. It, it's going to involve discursive actions about how we describe this history, um, how we interpret this history. So it, it's, um, as I say, it's, it's enormously complex and it is multi-institutional and it involves moving from different discursive systems, for example, um, health on the one hand and talking about um, historical historiography and the writing of history and what might be the connection between these things. Um, so it's an enormously complex thing. And um, I agree with Christian that at times it may not be helpful to talk about it as decolonization. It may be just talk about what we are trying to do in terms of, for example, addressing um, social justice or um, as we saw with um, uh, um, uh, George Floyd, um, questions to human rights. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's a vastly complex thing. But I, what, the thing I want to appeal to most is that um, the way, it, for example, in England, the, the co-option of this term, especially following Black Lives Matter, what you've had is this really embarrassing stampede of um, institutions now saying, we are decolonizing when they're doing absolutely none of the things that I've mentioned about addressing power and its distribution. So we really do have to kind of hold on to a definition. And I think David's definition is very helpful um, in terms of what decolonization is and what we need to do to overcome it. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Francis, and thank you to the rest of our panelists. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for your insights on what the arts can do for mental health and for how we need to be mindful of language, of definitions, and of developing a common understanding. And so once more, Dr. Francis, Dr. Fakunle, and Mr. Nyampeta, thank you very much for joining us for a conversation today. Thank you. Nice to meet the rest of the panel. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Thank you.